Welcome everyone. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Takaaki Kajita, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2015 for the discovery of neutrino oscillations, which meant that neutrinos have mass. Professor Kajita did his PhD studies in proton decay under Masatoshi Koshiba, who himself received the Nobel Prize in 2002 for the detection of cosmic neutrinos. After completing his PhD and in search for greater understanding of proton decay, Professor Kajita had to study atmospheric neutrinos as the background. So he built a giant detector called Super Kamio Kande. That's where he found something interesting from his experiments. Without further ado, I will leave Professor Kajita to share his work with you. Professor Kajita, please. Oh, okay. Hello. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to this uh, lecture. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about neutrino situations and small neutrino mass. Now, <clears throat> in this slide, you see a photo. This is inside of the super Kamiokande detector. So we have been studying neutrinos with this detector. And today, I'm going to talk about the neutrino oscillation discovery with this detector. Uh, next slide. OK, this is the outline of this talk. <clears throat> First, I have a brief introduction on what are neutrinos. Then I want to talk about the um, early days of the neutrino research in our uh, experimental site. <clears throat> then I want to move on to the discovery of neutrino oscillations, the importance of neutrino mass will be discussed, and I'll summarize this talk. Uh, next one. <clears throat> Okay, so this is the introduction. Uh, next one. Well, <clears throat> I, I guess some of you know about the neutrinos, but I, let, anyway, let me mention about the uh, neutrinos. Uh, neutrinos are fundamental particles like electrons and quarks. And neutrinos are something like electrons without electric charge. In fact, this feature is very important. So because of this feature, neutrinos do not feel the electromagnetic, electromagnetic force. Uh, therefore, neutrinos can easily pass through even the Earth. But they can interact with matter very rarely. And therefore, able to study neutrinos by observing these very rare neutrino interactions. Next page. Yeah. OK, so uh, I, I, I have um, some more uh, introductions. Um, neutrinos have three types or three flavors, namely electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos. Uh, next page. And also, I want to mention that in the very successful standard model of particle physics, <clears throat> neutrinos are assumed to have no mass. However, physicists have been asking neutrinos really have no mass. Uh, next page. Now, let me um, tell you how we observe these, these new neutrinos. Um, first of all, we can never see neutrinos themselves. Then how can we detect them? Well, uh, quick, quick ones, quick ones. Yeah, thank you. Um, neutrinos sometimes interact with the nucleus, 
then in this case, a charged particle is typically emitted. And if a charged particle propagates in the matter, we have many ways to observe them. And in our case, we use water. Uh, click, please. Yes. And then this charged particle emit photons. This is called chunk of photons. And we observe these photons by photo detectors or photomultiplier tubes. <laughs> and this way, we observe this charged particle. And by analyzing this charged part particle, we, un we understand that at this moment, neutrino interact. So this way, we study neutrinos. Uh, next page. OK, early days. Um, next page. OK, uh, let me introduce our first experiment in Kamioka. Uh, Kamioka is the location of this, these experiments. In the 1970s, Grand Unified Theories of elementary particles predicted that protons should decay with the lifetime of, a, of, of about 10 to 30 years. Well, this is an extremely long lifetime. But on the other hand, if we observe 10 to 30 protons for a year, and if the proton lifetime is 10 to 30 years, we should be able to observe one proton decay among these 10 to 30 protons. So th therefore, we have ways to observe proton decays. And also, this, this, uh, this prediction was extremely important. This theory was extremely important. Therefore, several proton decay experiments began in the early 80s. And one of them was the Kamiokande experiment. Here, uh, in the right side of this slide, I show the sketch of the Kamiokande experiment. It was a 3,000 ton, very large water detector. It had about 16 meters in diameter and 16 meters in height. And inside uh, this tank, uh, there was a lot of photomultiplier tubes in order to detect chunk of photons. In fact, it contains 3,000 tons of very clean water, and therefore there are a lot of protons inside. Therefore, we expect that some of the protons may decay spontaneously, um, emitting chunk of photons. Oh, well, well, okay, sorry. Uh, may, may decay proton. The protons may decay, and at that moment, uh, typically two to three particles are emitted, and these particles emit chunk of photons. And therefore, we should be able to observe these photons by these photomultiplier tubes instrumented in the tank. So this way, we hoped to observe proton decays. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> yeah, well, uh, first of all, in order to observe proton decays, we have to construct a detector. Therefore, in the spring of 1983, um, we came to the site that is the Kamioka village. And this photo was taken when we constructed the Kamiokande detector. And in the middle, you see Professor Koshiba, who was the leader of this experiment. And as introduced, he received Nobel Prize in Physics in 2002 with the uh, neutrino result from this detector. Anyway, 
uh, at that time we came to the site and in fact the site was in the active mine in fact at that moment uh, we are we were waiting for the mine train going inside and after this photo we took the mine train and went inside and we started the working in the uh, underground next page the actual construction work looked like this as i said the kamiokande tank had 16 meters in height and therefore we had to find a good way to install the photomultiplier tubes onto the detector wall and 16 meters is very high therefore we had a lot of discussion and finally we decided to use these plastic bolts to install the hot prior tubes and as you can see uh, we installed um, many hot prior tubes then if we complete we raise the water level then we begin to install the another layer of uh, another layer of photomat prior tubes so this way we constructed the Kamiokande detector and the experiment started in July 1983. Uh, next page. <clears throat> and of course, we wanted to observe proton decays. But, well, in any experiment, there must be background. And for the proton decay experiments, the most serious background is the neutrino interactions. And these neutrino interactions, uh, sorry, and these neutrinos are created in the atmosphere of the Earth. Well, there are cosmic rays. These are high energy particles coming to the Earth from somewhere in the universe and they are high energy protons or high energy helium or in some case a high energy iron nucleus um, and these cosmic rays once come into the air they interact with air nucleus producing pions typically and these pions are unstable therefore decay to a muon the muon is also unstable therefore decay to an electron and during this decay chain neutrinos are created and of course most of these neutrinos simply pass through even the earth but some of them interact in the kamiokande detector and they are the most serious background to the search for proton decays uh, next page. Okay, um, of course, we wanted to observe proton decays. However, even after three years from the start of the experiment, we didn't observe any clear proton decay signals. But at the time, around 1983 and 1986 we had already a substantial number of neutrino backgrounds therefore since we have many background events uh, we begin to think that maybe there are some proton decay signals among the background events and in fact we thought that we have to improve the proton decay analysis and for this we developed new software well okay if you if you develop a software you have to test 
this software very extensively. In fact, we did various tests, and at the end, um, as a test of the uh, final one, uh, we studied the uh, neutrino type for the atom sec neutrino events, and then we found that the number of mu neutrino events was much fewer than expected. Well, of course, that was a test. And test told us that the test result was unexpected. Therefore, this is suggesting that there must be something wrong with the newly developed software. So we thought that it, it's very likely that there were some mistakes somewhere in the data analysis maybe and or data reduction or somewhere. Anyway, it was clear that there, there must be some problem. So we started various studies to find mistakes. Well, we studied for about a year, but somehow we were unable to find any serious mistakes. So after one about a year of study, um, we conclude, concluded that the muon neutrino deficit cannot be due to any major problem in the data analysis or the simulation. And therefore, we decided to report these data to the public. So we wrote a paper, and the essence of the paper is shown in this slide in the middle. So we, we simply counted the number of muon neutrino events, which were something 80 some number, and compared with the simulation. Well, according to the simulation, we should be able to observe more than 140 events. And we also counted the number of electron neutrino events. And for this, the data and the simulation agreed reasonably well. So that was a report. Well, we simply reported uh, this result. We very carefully checked that we do not have any mistake. So that was the report. But clearly, this data, this data told us that there must be something that we do not understand. And although we had no clear idea what was the cause of the deficit, I was most excited with the data. And therefore, I changed my research completely from the proton decay studies to neutrino studies to know what is happening in neutrinos. The next page. Well, certainly at that time, we had no idea what was the real solution uh, to the problem or what was the real cause for the problem. But from the beginning, we thought that maybe the deficit is due to neutrino oscillations. And in fact, neutrino oscillation was the phenomena that was predicted more than half a century ago by theoretical people. Uh, they are listed in the right side, Maki, Nakagawa, Sakata, and Pontecorvo. And according to them, if neutrinos have mass, neutrinos change their type from one type to the other. For example, muon neutrino could oscillate to neutral, 
And here in this uh, left side um, figure, I want to show. So suppose a mu neutrino begin to propagate from the left to the right, then at some point, the probability that mu neutrino to remain a mu neutrino goes down. And if this neutrino still continue to propagate to the right, then the prob probability come back to unity. Then come back to uh, come to low, come back to unity, low, and so on. And when the mu neutrino, the prob when the probability that mu neutrino to remain mu neutrino goes down at that time, the probability that mu neutrino to tau neutrino goes up. So this way, essentially. Uh, a mu neutrino to change to tau neutrino, mu neutrino, tau neutrino, mu neutrino, and so on. So this is the neutrino oscillations. And if this is happening, uh, we can easily explain the the reason that <laughs> we can easily explain why there was a muon neutrino deficit. Uh, next page. Well, okay, I explained the neutrino oscillations, and this could explain the muon neutrino deficit observed in Kamiokande. However, there were several other possibilities um, you can imagine. So, as the next step, um, we'd, we'd like to um, find out the cause for the deficit. Namely, we'd like to know if the deficit was due to neutrino oscillations or by some other reasons. And for this, we thought this way. I said that neutrinos are created by cosmic ray interactions. Then some of these neutrinos are created above us, maybe 10 to, 10 to 20 kilometers above us. And these neutrinos, after propagating 10 to 20 kilometers, come to the detector and they may interact. And the flight length is only 10 to 20 kilometers, therefore, the flight lengths may not be long enough to oscillate. On the other hand, neutrinos are also created in the, in the other side of the Earth. And for these neutrinos, uh, they have to propagate inside the Earth before interacting in the detector. So they have to propagate the whole Earth. And the diameter of the Earth is uh, more than 10,000 kilometers. And therefore, they have to travel very long distance. And therefore, they may oscillate to other neutrino flavor. And if this picture is right, uh, we should observe the up versus down asymmetry of the atom sake mu neutrinos. And if we observe this, then clearly um, we can separate the neutrino oscillations from other possibilities. Unfortunately, the Kamiokande detector, which had only 3,000 tons of pure water, was too small to study this kind of uh, effect. Clearly, we needed a much larger detector, and that was Super Kamiokande. Uh, next slide. Now I want to move on to the discovery of neutrino oscillations. And this is the Super Kamiokande detector. It is a um, very large underground uh, detector. It, it contains 50,000 tons of very pure water. It has about 40 meters in diameter and 40 meters in height. 
And by the way, this is an international collaboration. At present, we have about 190 collaborators from 10 countries. Okay, next page. <clears throat> um, the construction of the Super Kamiokande experiment started in 1991, and the construction period was for five years. And in the fifth year, we collaborators came to the underground at the Super Kamiokande site to install the photomite prior tubes into the, into the detector wall. And this photo was taken in the spring of 19, 1995. And as you can see, these many people worked in underground in this year. And I also want to mention that among these people, maybe 80% of them are physicists. So in, in that year, we worked in underground to construct the detector. Uh, next page. Anyway, the work was successful. And in January 96, um, we started filling pure water into the Super Kamiokande tank. And this photo was taken from the top of the detector, seen inside. And you can see the water level clearly from water level clearly by looking at the uh, uh, plastic boats. Anyway, uh, this way we constructed the detector and we started the experiment in April 96. Uh, next page. <clears throat> And the, uh, from the beginning of the experiment, we observed neutrino interactions. This is one example. This is a, um, this is a muon neutrino interaction observed in Super Kamiokande. You can see a clear uh, ring shape uh, image. And this is the uh, image of the photons observed by the photomite prior tubes installed in the Super Kamiokande detector. And the circle, uh, you can see the circles. And the size of the circle represent the parasite or photo intensity from uh, recorded in each photomite prior tubes. And also these circles are colored and the colors indicate the photon arrival timing. Red indicates that these photons came early, and the blue indicates that the photons came late. So these are the uh, neutrino interactions. And <clears throat> in Super Kamiokande, we observed about 10 neutrino events in a day. And <clears throat> we studied these neutrinos as a team. Uh, next slide. And in fact, we worked very hard. And, and due to this very hard work, in two years, we were able to report the first important result at the Neutrino Conference. And in the left side, I show one of the pages that were presented at the Neutrino Conference in 1998. And around that time, we didn't have power. We didn't have PowerPoint. Therefore, we used this kind of um, handwritten slides. Anyway, um, there's a reason that I show the this uh, slide. The bottom plot is very important. Um, the bottom plot shows the uh, uh, number of events as a function of neutrino arrival direction for muon neutrinos. And cosine theta one means downgoing neutrinos and minus one means upward going neutrinos. 
and the black circles is the error bars shows the data, <coughs> and the um, shaded histogram shows the Monte Carlo prediction. Then you find for downgoing neutrinos, the data and the prediction agreed quite well. On the other hand, for upward going neutrinos, the data showed almost a factor of two deficit compared to the prediction. And this can be very well explained if we assume neutrino oscillations, namely, as shown in the right, um, a muon neutrino produced in the, other, in the other side of the Earth uh, propagate in the Earth, then the neutrino type change from muon neutrino to tau neutrino, muon neutrino, tau neutrino, and so on. Therefore, when these neutrinos come to the super cameo candy detector, the probability that muon neutrino remaining as muon neutrino is 0.5. So this way, neutrino oscillation was discovered. <clears throat> uh, next page. Yeah, OK. Well, of course. Uh, we simply reported our result at the conference for neutrino physicists, but well, very, very surprising thing happened on the next day. Um, the President Clinton gave a talk at MIT's 98 commencement, and in fact, uh, his speech is still um, visible in YouTube. Anyway, um, during his talk, his speech, he mentioned about the uh, discovery of neutrino stations. And here, I copied that part. And I simply want to read. Uh, just yesterday in Japan, physicists announced a discovery that tiny neutrinos have mass. Now, that may not mean much to most Americans, but it may change our most fundamental theories from the nature of the smallest subatomic particles to how the universe itself works and indeed how it expands. And of, of course, as the US president, he mentioned that in this experiment, uh, US physicists are working. Then he came back. The larger issue is that these kinds of findings have implications that are not limited to the laboratory. They, they affect the whole of a society, not only our economy, but our very view of life, our understanding of our relations with others, and our place in time. So I think we were really honored to hear this kind of remark by the US president. Next page. Now, so far, I have discussed the, uh, res our result, our discovery of neutrino oscillations. And I also mentioned that President, President Clinton mentioned our result in his speech. But you may wonder why the neutrino mass is so important. Well, electrons have mass, quarks have mass, Therefore, it may be natural that neutrinos have mass. Why it is so important that um, neutrinos have mass? And here, I want to show why we think that neutrino mass are important. Um, here in this uh, plot, I show the mass of charged leptons and quarks. They are shown by red, green, and blue colors. And also, I plotted the uh, neutrino mass, which is plotted by gray colors. And you can see that the neutrino mass is much smaller than the other particles' mass. And in fact, the neutrino mass approximately, or maybe more than 10 billion or 10 orders of magnitude, smaller than the corresponding mass of quarks and charged leptons. 
very small neutrino mass are very small <coughs> and extremely small and we believe this is the key to better understand elementary particles and the universe and of course if we understand why neutrino mass are so small we better understand elementary particles but the point is this small mass is also be the key to understand the universe and i'd like to show you why we think so next page here i show the uh, picture of the well, photo of the universe <clears throat> you see many stars and galaxies <clears throat> <clears throat> and we know that these stars and galaxies are made of uh, matter. We know that there is no antimatter star or no antimatter galaxy. But this is a little strange when we think about the Big Bang universe. Um, at the beginning of the universe, the universe was very hot. And in this very hot Big Bang universe, particles and antiparticles were always created simultaneously. Therefore, in the Big Bang universe, we naively expect that the number of matter particles and the antimatter particles should have been equal. But it is not, well, but now we see only matter particles. And for this, um, we have to explain why we have the matter particles at present. And well, in fact, we, we understand the answer. Uh, we understand the reason. At the Big Bang universe, the number of matter particles were, I would say, 1 billion plus 1. On the other hand, number of antiparticles were 1 billion they were almost equal. Then with the universe cooled down, particles and, and anti uh, particles and antimatter particles meet and annihilate. Therefore, at present, we have the only one matter particle that is, uh, that is coming from one billion plus one. Okay, so this way we can explain why uh, we have matter particles at present. But, well, one billion one is almost equal to one billion, but not exactly. Therefore, we, we should be able to explain why in the Big Bang universe, there was one extra matter particle. And in fact, we do not know the reason. But <clears throat> many of us think that neutrinos with very small mass might be the key to understand this big mystery of the matter in the universe. So we think um, we should keep studying neutrinos to understand this big mystery of the universe. Uh, next page. And of course, uh, in order to understand uh, this mystery, we have to understand neutrino properties through neutrino experiments. Unfortunately, the present day experiments are not powerful enough. Therefore, we have to construct the next generation experiment. And in fact, <clears throat> there are two big projects going on. One is in United States and the other in Japan. And with these, uh, these experiments, we would like to observe if the oscillation of neutrinos and those of anti-neutrinos are different. If we observe this effect, this could be the first step to understand the matter in the universe. Uh, next page. And since I'm from Japan, I'd like to briefly discuss the Japanese project. Well, actually, this is well Japan-based project. This is an international project. 
Um, we are going to construct the hypercamucan detector. It will be about eight times larger, larger than the supercamucan detector. And because of this extremely large mass, we expect many important research topics in neutrino physics. And the construction already started in 2020, last year, and we expect the experiment will start in 2027. And it is a very large international collaboration. We have more than 400 members from 19 countries. So, a new genome experiment will be quite interesting in the, even in the future. Uh, next page. Okay, let me summarize. Atomic muon neutrino deficit was observed by proton leak experiments unexpectedly. Subsequently, in 1998, Super Kamiokande discovered neutrino oscillations, which shows that neutrinos have mass. The discovery of non zero neutrino mass opened a window to study physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. And neutrinos with small mass might also be the key to understand the fundamental questions of the universe. And I feel that I was very fortunate. I had very good advisors, colleagues, and I was involved in very good projects. Um, click, please. So, in conclusion, I would like to say that like this, if we work hard and if we are lucky, nature kind, kindly tell us the secret of it. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Kajita. Uh, I think the audience enjoyed it very much and they have a number of questions for you. Uh, some of them have to do with the detector itself. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, there was a question wondering how you get such large volumes of purified water into the detector. And uh, another question was about the Antares uh, project uh, and whether you could compare the neutrino detector in Kamioka to uh, the Antares uh, in terms of precision and data processing. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. About the first question. I think we were lucky because um, in that mountain, even in 1,000 meter underground, we have a lot of water, natural water, natural clean water. Therefore, we can use this water as the primary source for our detector water. Of course, we have to purify them, but we, I think we were lucky. About the, then the second question, about the comparison of Antares and Kamiokande or Super Kamiokande. Well, in fact, Antares is much larger than Super Kamiokande. However, I think the uh, physics topics is different. Um, in Super Kamiokande, we observe um, atmospheric neutrinos that we discussed today, and also we, dis we observe neutrinos from the sun, they are quite low energy. So we have to install a lot of photomultiplier tubes in order to efficiently uh, observe the chain of photons. On the other hand, Antares is a much larger detector and they are going to observe very high energy um, astrophysical neutrinos. And for, for this purpose, they do not need to in, um, install photomultiplier tubes very, very densely. So um, that is the main, I believe, the main difference. Thank you. Uh, there's uh, some questions uh, in physics, uh, one of which is uh, whether observations of neutrino oscillation would indicate whether the neutrino is Dirac or Majorana fermion. Oh, thank you very much for this question. Um, unfortunately, neutrino oscillations cannot tell about the uh, neutrino nature, Dirac or Majorana. We need a separate experiment. And 
Well, we definitely think that we should observe uh, neutrino rest double beta decay in order to tell that neutrinos are Majorana. Okay, uh, another physics question. So some of the theoretical scenarios, uh, scenarios assume that uh, the small mass of the neutrino uh, comes from extremely large mass of unobserved neutrinos. Yeah. So in terms of the experiment, uh, is it possible to confirm this hypothesis? Okay, well, first of all, these extremely massive neutrino-like particles are too massive. Therefore, we have no way to create them directly. So therefore, um, in this sense, uh, we have no direct way to confirm this idea. But well, of course, we have to be smart enough. And I hope that the next generation people will find out to test this hypothesis. OK, uh, maybe one final question. Uh, how did you manage to convince the Japanese government to invest on the detector? And um, you know, what kind of uh, output or application did you propose before you found the neutrino? And uh, what is the Kamiokande facility used for today after you have found the neutrino? OK, thank you. Well, well OK, so you have several questions. Uh, first of all, how we do we convince the Japanese government? Well, I, I think we were fortunate because we were able to convince the Japanese government by science. We convinced that neutrino physics is very important. And about the second question, um, about the location of the old Kamiokande. Um, in fact, that location is used in other neutrino experiment. This experiment is called Kamran. And this experiment observed um, anti-neutrinos from nuclear power reactors in Japan. And this way, this experiment made a huge contribution to the electron-neutrino oscillations. So uh, this way, we use the uh, uh, underground site very efficiently. OK, OK. Uh, so are you still continuing on the proton decay? I myself, uh, no. I myself oh. changed my uh, field from neutrino physics or proton decay to gravitational waves. OK. OK, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kajita, for that uh, wonderful talk. And uh, the answers that you've given are very illuminating. Uh, and I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in to this uh, GYSS talk today. And I hope uh, all of you have also uh, equally enjoyed this talk uh, from Professor Kajita. So I know uh, we can't hear your applause, but I would thank uh, Professor Kajita on all of your behalf and uh, wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much.